Step 3. Examples of Maxwell's first equation. In the previous step, we saw how to derive uh, Gauss's law, which is the Maxwell's first equation. And in this step, we're going to apply it to some very simple cases that just to see how uh, the calculations work out. So first, we're going to consider two charges that are enclosed by a spherical surface. So we've got our charge plus Q over here and a charge negative Q over there. And the position of these charges, again, doesn't really, really matter. The thing to bear in mind is that they are uh, equal in size but opposite in sign. And we're going to ask, what's the flux of the electric field produced by these two charges going through this closed spherical surface? So we know from Maxwell's uh, first law that what we have to uh, compute is the sum of the charges, which in this case is very easy. It's just Q minus Q, which is equal to zero. So this means that the total flux going through the spherical surface is zero. That's interesting the, because the area is finite. So does that mean that in order to get the total flux to be zero, do we require that the electric field is also zero? And the question is no. If the, if the electric field was zero, then we could just place any charge in here, inside the sphere, and the charge would not move. And this is not true. This is not what happens. If you put some test charge, let's say a negative charge closer to Q, it's going to feel a force and it's going to be pushed away, um, away, sorry, it will be pushed towards Q. If it's positively charged, then it will be pushed away. We can, we can represent this by drawing the electric field lines. So we can clearly see that the electric field uh, inside the sphere is not zero. It goes from the positive charge to the negative charge, and in particular, it also goes outside of the sphere and goes backwards. So if we just look at one small area, let's say here, all we have to do is we have to compute the dot product between the electric field and the, uh, uh, the, um, the vector corresponding to the small infinitesimal area. And that's not going to be zero. The thing is that uh, whatever flux we have through the small area here will be cancelled by uh, the flux going backwards towards Q at some other place on the sphere somewhere here. So when we add all of them up, together they produce the result of zero. But it doesn't mean that the electric flux in uh, electric field is zero. Now consider a different case. Consider a um, charged metal sphere. Before, we were considering the surface to be some fictitious surface uh, in free space. But now we have a physical metal sphere and we distribute charge all uh, uh, on, on this sphere. The thing about metals is that they've got lots of free, free uh, 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 the charge is free to move in metals. So what happens is that if we place some charge Q on the sphere, it will automatically uh, try to distribute uniformly over the entire surface. And we want to know what's the electric field uh, produced by such a, a, a charged metal sphere. And in particular, what are the electric fields and uh, corresponding flux uh, at some point A outside of, of the sphere and another point B that's inside the sphere. So again, let's apply our Maxwell's uh, first equation. Yep, so we want to know the charge outside, sorry, uh, here. So let's start with the point outside of the sphere given by the point A. And we say that it's distance away from the center of the charged metal sphere. Again, Maxwell's first equation tells us that the total flux of the electric field uh, going through this new fictitious sphere uh, with uh, radius r is given by the uh, total charge enclosed by this uh, new sphere divided by the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught. So this uh, sum over all the charges is actually very simple. We know that the total charge is just Q. It doesn't matter that it's not a collection of point charges, that it's actually distributed uniformly over a charged metal sphere. The total magnitude of the charge enclosed by this new sphere going through A is just Q. So we have that the total flux is capital Q divided by epsilon zero. But also, we have the following. We have uh, that, the char uh, that the total flux is given by the surface integral. And again, like we saw in the previous step, 
we can very easily compute this integral. It's just given by the magnitude of the electric field, distance r away from the center of the sphere, times 4 pi r squared. So, we obtain that the electric field at point A is given by the following, q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. How did we get it? We just equated this expression right here with this expression right there. Now this is interesting because what this tells us is that the electric field perceived at point A outside of the charged metal sphere is the same electric field that would have been produced if we only had a point charge inside a sphere with magnitude Q. So from an observer outside of the sphere, it doesn't matter that this uh, charge is distributed over a metallic surface um, or if it's just concentrated in one point at the center of the sphere. The electric field is the same. Now let's consider the different surface given by this point B. So now we're looking at uh, this fictitious surface uh, inside the metal sphere. So again, we're going to apply Maxwell's first equation and what do we get? We get that the sum of all the charge enclosed by this surface is zero. Why is that? Because all the charge is outside of this surface going through B, right? All the charge is distributed over the metal sphere and that metal sphere is outside of our little sphere. So the sum of the charges enclosed by the little sphere is zero. Now in this case, this does imply that the electric field inside this small sphere is zero. Why is that? Because the surface of the sphere is a finite number and there are no uh, uh, sources of uh, electric field uh, inside the sphere. So we, there is no cancellation like in the previous example. The only way how we can satisfy this, um, this expression that the total flux is zero is if the electric field is zero. And now this point B, it could be anywhere inside inside this metal sphere. So it could be very close to the surface as well. And it, the electric field would still be zero. So what we get is we get that the electric field vanishes inside a metal sphere. Remember, if we are outside of the metal sphere at this point A, then the electric field that's produced by the metal sphere is the same as if we just concentrated all the charge in a single point charge located at the center of the sphere but inside the sphere, there is no electric field. So if we put some, uh, some test charge, let's say uh, in here, closer to the surface, that test charge would not move. Why is that? That's because the electric field is zero, therefore the force is zero. But you might think, well, if we place it closer to the surface down here, then it surely must feel uh, uh, the force contribution from all this charge over here. So it should either move towards it or be pushed away from it. Well, we also have to consider all the contributions from this larger surface. So even though it's further away from our test charge, the total contribution from this larger surface that's further away on our test charge will cancel exactly the contributions of this smaller area that the test charge is closer to. There we go. If, for example, if the charge is, uh, uh, on the sphere is positive and we put a uh, electron, so a negatively charged particle, closer to the surface over here, it would not move. 